Hey you guys, I want to talk about two individuals. I want to talk about Leighton Flowers and also Roger Olson, but let's start with Leighton Flowers first. So apparently Flowers is um, a pastor at a church somewhere and he also writes a blog called Soteriology 101. Now me and him had a back and forth over one of his blogs that was called um, Does God Hate the Unborn? Now, obviously, this is an emotive challenge against the Calvinistic interpretation of Romans 9, and so I decided to respond to it. Now, I already wrote a blog responding to this blog post, but what I want to do is uh, respond or give my impression of some of the things that he put in the comments sec section of his blog in response to me. Now, part of this is out of context, and it wasn't my, it wasn't my point to read his um, entire comment to me or give you the context of our back and forth, but part of this will um, become evident as I go along. Uh, beginning at maybe, he says, maybe some are able to emotionally separate themselves systematically by objectifying those who are supposedly hated from birth, but I guess God did not determine my heart to be so callous toward the unborn masses because such teaching doesn't draw my heart to worship him, but to be repulsed. Now, no doubt, that will invoke the questioning of my salvation, and I'm fine with that. I wish not to be saved by a God who would do this. I would rather burn. That may sound like I'm being emotive or using hyperbole, but it is not. I've thought about this very rationally, and I do not believe it is at all rational to conclude that I would rather burn in hell than believe in or teach about a God who hates most unborn babies, seals them in their disabled condition their entire lives, and then burns them for eternity for doing what he unchangeably determined for them to do. Now, of course, none of those things were actual arguments. It was just pure emotion, but just let me point out something. He says that he would rather go to hell than reform his doctrine. Now, I am much more okay with a person that comes at the text and honestly believe that it says something different than the Calvinist position and they just admit their biases. But when somebody says that they would rather go to hell than reform their doctrine, I mean, this is the complete definition of what eisegesis is. You take an idea that it has to be something and then you implant it onto the text no matter what the text says. At this point, it doesn't really matter what exactly Romans 9 means, but what I am trying to point out is that he, is, he has this hermeneutical methodology that makes it so that the text cannot speak for itself, but he must impose his ideas on it. If there are any Christians that say that they would rather go to hell than to reform their doctrine, then they are not Christians. My second example of the same mentality is from Roger Olson. Now, Roger Olson did this extremely small PDF file that's called uh, Arminianism Frequently Asked Questions. Everything you wanted to know. Obviously, it's not everything. It's kind of absurd to have this subtitle like that. But um, within this, he makes some comments about Romans 9 as well. And the title for this section is How Does Arminianism Explain Romans 9? Let me just read to you something that he said within his section. I'll just read this for you. But for me, what is more important is that Wesley said about the Calvinist interpretation of Romans 9, quote, whatever it means, it can't mean that, unquote. He was not merely brushing it aside. He meant, and I agree, that if the Calvinist interpretation of Romans 9 is true, then God is a moral monster, an arbitrary dammer, not in any way like Jesus Christ who wept over Jerusalem. Clearly, Roger Olson doesn't give two cents about what the scripture actually says, and he himself admits that along with light and flowers. It would be one thing if these men tried to be somewhat honest in their approach to the text, but honestly, they just don't care. And this is a form of Arminian rationalism. They just superimpose their feelings and all of their arbitrary doctrine upon scripture. It seems that there is often no middle grounds within Arminianism. Either the person is completely ignorant, or they're an enemy of the faith. I would like to end with a quotation from Calvin's Institutes towards the beginning of his Institutes. Indeed, vanity joined with pride can be detected in the fact that, in seeking God, miserable men do not rise above themselves as they should, but measure him by the yardstick of their own carnal stupidity, 
and neglect sound investigation. Thus, out of curiosity, they fly off into empty speculations. They do not therefore apprehend God as he offers himself, but imagine him as they have fashioned him in their own presumption.